Huge welcome to you and thank you for joining us at 9.30 in the morning. One of the reasons why I wanted to do 9.30 is so that you can actually start the day, develop an action plan and feel really engaged and, and inspired for the rest of the day. This is a, a really important subject for us and we really wanted to run a session this financial year. So what we really wanted to do is to run an event for experienced HR professionals that are currently sort of in the process or considering transitioning into to a new role. And HR has taken a lot of the cuts and so some very capable people have been made uh, redundant. Um, and so it's just a case of how can you have a process in place to really support you through the next step in your journey. So what we wanted to do is to reach out and find two really great experts in their area to really sort of help you develop the, the right disciplines and the right approach to aid you as much as possible. So we, our first guest today is going to be June Hogan. June Hogan is, a, is an experienced HR professional and runs and founded Wildwood Coaching. What's really nice about both of our guests is they've both got extensive HR experience. Um, so they can see it from both sides as both supporting and in that role, that, that felt that lived experience. And in that time, she worked mainly as an HR generalist. She's also had personal experience of what it means to go through the redundancy process, both facilitating it and experiencing it. As I said, she's an experienced coach and, and her team work UK wide, providing a full suite of services, which is like coaching and workshops, CV writings, all the way into placement as well. Our second guest is, is the brilliant Nicola Morris, and she's from an organisation called Culture Recruitment. And she again has, has extensive experience in HR management and talent acquisition with 10 years experience on the front line, actually working with organisations. And she also um, plays a leading role in culture recruitment, recruitment and executive search function with them 10 years. Um, has extensive experience of helping place um, HR candidates into senior roles across the different HR disciplines as well. And Nicola is really passionate about bringing the best out in her candidates and both of them will be sharing their expertise during the day. So just a little bit about the agenda. What we wanted to do is to give you a little bit of context. So to upfront, just give you an HR job market update. So what is, you know, we see so much news out there, but what does the data actually tell us? You know, where should we be, we be focused our efforts? Should we be anxious or not about the real life situation? We'll then flip over to June, who's then going to help you sort of prepare for the job search campaign. And she'll be taking you through all the steps from the moment you actually start to consider changing roles to the point you actually get into your role about how you can actually develop a really comprehensive plan. And, and then we'll be inviting you in for a Q&A with June. So throughout the whole session, feel free as questions come to you or observations, please feel free to make them in the chat box. If you'd rather keep these confidential, then please feel free just to message um, Valentina De Laurentiis in the chat box privately. If you've got a personal question you'd like to be asked, but you just wouldn't like to be named, that's absolutely no problem. And then after that, we then switch to Nicola. And Nicola's going to give you a really, really tactical view on how to develop your personal brand, um, how to actually position yourself in the market, how to prepare for your interview, and how to really make sure that when it comes to these situations, you're putting your best foot forward and give yourself the best opportunity as well. And again, it'll be followed up with a Q&A with Nicola at the end. So yeah, thanks for the, the great introduction there, Garen. Um, I'm Nicola Morris from, from Culture Recruitment. Um, my, my first section, as Garen suggested, I'll be covering off what the current UK uh, job market looks like, hopefully to help you position yourselves uh, a little bit more as you go out into the market. So actually, um, this is a question that I've always been asked, uh, regardless of, you know, the pandemic, uh, what does the current job market look like? And 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 it's a, always a difficult question to, to answer in, in the best of times, but even more so currently um, with such um, uncertain times. So what I'd like to actually do, first of all, is just push this question out to, to you guys, really, just to, to see how you're, you're feeling about the market. You know, this is, it, it, there's an element of, um, you know, it, this is a personal feeling as well. You may well have a number of applications out there uh, and you're actually feeling very positive and confident about that. Or you may just think that, you know, there's just nothing out there for me. So just a bit of a temperature gauge, really, first of all. So, Gary, I think you've got another poll question for, for everyone, if you don't mind loading that up on the screen. Yeah, so I think this really confirms what I said. It's, it, it is really a personal view on how you, you feel, um, regardless of what the stats are saying. It, it is a personal gut feeling about the market. Um, so you know, a handful of you look feeling very optimistic and then 34% of you really worried because there aren't, you don't feel there are the relevant roles out there. So, okay, now that's really interesting. Thank you for that. So I'm going to share with you now. So this is a, um, this is taken from the CIPD's latest um, UK labour market report. Um, 
this was actually undertaken back in January um, with about 2,000 uh, HR professionals and business leaders. Uh, already, I think, given the report was launched in February, we're now heading towards April. Even now, I think some of that data is very slightly out of out of date because we are moving um, so quickly. But I'll be quite interested to see what next month's report looks like, which I think um, will we'll cover the, the second quarter of, of 2021. But here is a snapshot. Um, so this, this slide shows three key headlines from that particular report. The first diagram there uh, indicates employment confidence overall is currently at its highest since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this is the net, intent, net employment intentions figure. This measures the difference between the proportion of employers expecting to add jobs compared to employers planning to cut positions. Um, and this rose to 11 uh, this quarter, which is its highest in a year. This compares to minus one in the previous quarter. Um, I think the, the increase um, in confidence is also down to the sharp fall in redundancy intentions, which went was down from 30% to 20%. And then that uptick in the recruitment intentions. So the second diagram here, um, that talks a little bit about employment confidence by sector. So you can see that healthcare, ICT, business services, um, they are a lot more confident about hiring over the, the coming quarter. And it's no surprise really to see that hospitality is, is um, down there as, as the lowest. This might help you, you know, position yourself when looking at the job market, looking at vacancies. You're going to like, you're more likely to be, able to be seeing the vacancies sitting in some of these uh, sectors here. And then the third um, diagram here is a percentage of employee, employers who are intending to make redundancies. And this has um, dropped quite significantly over the last um, few weeks with a sharp uh, drop from with only 20 percent of organisations expected to make redundancies um, compared to, um, you know, sort of 33 uh, here in the last quarter. Right. So. The report also um, demonstrates the ev evidence that the UK market is actually gathering pace um, it, and it's actually reaching um, its, its highest levels actually since winter 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 report. 56 uh, percent of employers were intending to recruit in the first quarter of 2021, which was up from 3 percent from the autumn and 7 percent from the summer. However, it is, it's um, just good to point out that this is still 10 percent lower than we were this time last year. Uh, again, this this um, this just uh, splits out the confidence level and the, the, the recruitment pace gathering uh, across sector. Um, healthcare employers looking to hire, with 80% of healthcare employers looking to hire and only 36% of hospitality employers looking to hire. Right, okay, so this is another, um, another report I came across during my research. Um, this is actually uh, a report published by Monster uh, and actually outlines some of the anticipated challenges that recruiters and hiring managers will be facing throughout this year. And I think this is important for you to understand um, as a candidate, uh, because I know that you know things like this will have an impact on processes being slow, not hearing um, back from people, and that can le lead you to feeling pr pretty frustrated. So I think it's good to point out what some of those challenges are going to be for, for, for hiring managers. Um, so the report found the biggest challenge is actually finding candidates with the right skill set. Interestingly, the three key skill sets that seem to be missing at the moment um, being critical thinking, communication skills, and then dedication. Uh, so understanding where these key skill gaps are, I think will help you again, position yourself during the application and during the interview process, really honing in on those skills that seem to be missing and, and, and bringing those out on your CV and, and in the interview process. Uh, secondly, uh, perhaps this is an obvious one, you know, that work-life balance expectation, uh, particularly um, as we come out of lockdown, it's going to be a massive amount of uncertainty about what that work-life balance in um, presenteeism in the office, working from home, all of that still a little bit up in the air. And then thirdly, the re virtual recruitment process, uh, the challenge of hiring people without physically meeting, have they truly being able to assess that cultural fit. 
And on that third point, um, the report went on to, to break that down a little bit further. Um, those the, the key challenges that recruiters are facing during that recruitment and sele uh, selection process. Uh, points two and three here have been heavily impacted, I think, by the volume of candidates for each role. So, um, you know, identifying the um, candidates quickly, effectively screening candidates pre-interview with high, such high volume, those two factors are going to be impacted upon. And quite often because points two and three um, are slowing the process down, candidates have often moved on, found another job or even lost interest and therefore not fully engaged by the time the employer is ready to move forward. And this is another report here by CV Library. Um, and this is just the impact specifically on the HR market. Um, Surprise, yeah, this is the first one actually surprised me. The report indicated that HR have actually been one of the most in demand roles over the last few months um, and continue to be so. I must admit, as HR recruiter, it didn't feel that way. And, and as, as perhaps as a HR candidate, you didn't feel it being you know, that way. Um, but I think that's just the, the crazy times we're, we're living in at the moment. Um, and actually, maybe the point two around um, advertisements for HR consultant, seeing a steepest rise uh, to 57% last year, that may well have also had that sort of impact on, on point one. And I think, you know, we all need to take a bit of comfort from, from CV Library's comment there about HR is needed right now. Um, there has been a sur recent surge of HR vacancies. Uh, this is really attributed to companies always needing help with people management issues. So really just take comfort in that we are all needed and will continue to be needed. And that's me for now. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Nick. And we'll hear from you again. Um, yeah very shortly. Um, but now I'm going to introduce uh, June. So June, are you ready to go? So thanks, Nick. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, really interesting just to hear that introduction from Nick in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the fact that the market's gathering pace and it's an encouraging picture out there. And, and a great just to find out about the audience as well in terms of your, your situation. Um, sort of 70% of you look, looking for jobs currently in a role um, and sort of around 20% of you not in employment. So when we were putting this presentation together, we were kind of pitching it um, kind of at, at the people who may be currently out of work and looking for work so I've got a little bit of that to introduce at the start but certainly lots of what I'm talking about will apply equally uh, whether you're in work or, or whether you are um, uh, looking for work. So what I hope to do in the next kind of 30 minutes is really give you some practical tools, techniques, tips, structures, things that you can go away and think about um, whether or not, as I say, you're currently out of work or whether that's something that you might think might be a possibility, sort of understanding the sort of the current situation with your current employer. Um, this isn't about being prescriptive, certainly when I work with clients one-to-one -one or in group settings, it's about what's going to work for you. There's no kind of magic formula. Certainly, as Nick will go on to talk about, there are quite a few do's and don'ts uh, when you're presenting yourself in the market. Um, but really, this is a about sharing some insights and getting you to really take, take that step back and understand what you have to offer and also what you're looking for. And being really sort of super specific about that can help you stand out in the market, can help you when you're engaging with recruitment consultants and can ultimately help that, that job search more sustainable. So please, as Charlie said, put those questions in the chat. Um, don't feel just because we work in HR, we should know everything, because if you did, then maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to come here. Um, so please put the questions in and, and feel free to private message if, if you want to. So these are some of the things that are, that are attached to a job, and I'm sure you, you could add to this list um, as well. So when you think about all of the things that a job means, in terms of a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, gives you that place in society, your identity. It's more than just a paycheck. So when that's threatened um, in a redundancy situation or indeed taken away, or you're thinking about changing roles, understandably, all of these things can contribute to quite a lot of emotion, certainly when you're facing a redundancy situation, but also when you're thinking about that change, because essentially lots of these things will change as well as well as changing the job. So change is emotional, as I'm sure we all know. Uh, for some of you, this won't be the first time you've thought about changing roles, the first time you've been in a redundancy situation, um, and there's a huge amount of emotion attached to it. This was a, a screen grab from a workshop I did recently um, with, with a, 
a company and two separate workshops and we did a mentee meter and said, you know, how, how do you feel about your redundancy? And I'm always really interested to see the range of emotions that people have. So and the, the big, for those of you that know mentee meter, the big word is, is the one that's most popular. So some people see it as a new start, they're excited, it's a fresh opportunity, it's the kick they needed to do something, they hadn't been enjoying their job for a while and they really wanted to get out but they didn't know how to. And for others, there's the disappointment, um, you know, the fact that they feel um, undervalued, worried about the future and anxious. So um, understanding that if you find yourself with some of these emotions, either now or in the future, when you're thinking about change, particularly if um, you've been impacted by redundancy, this is kind of normal. This is, this is what change does to us. Many of you will be familiar with the Kubler-Ross change curve if you've implemented change programs in the past in organizations or through your CIPD studies. And it's quite a neat model that just explains the emotion of change, how change can affect us. Uh, don't propose to sort of go through it in detail, but depending on your circumstances, depending on your situation, you, you may be able to identify with some of these different stages. And certainly in my own experience of redundancy, I can absolutely identify with the, the, the shock and the denial and the kind of the disbelief that is this really happening um, going into that that level of frustration well I had a job that I enjoyed I didn't you know why did this have to happen to me um, and taking some time to really think about how I'm going to experiment and engage with the new situation so that's a really nice neat model and it looks great on the page doesn't it but in reality um, change can be very different my slide isn't working there we go that's probably more like what change looks like. So for those of you, again, that, that for the 20% of you that have been out of work, and maybe as a result of redundancy, you may be able to more identify with that squiggle on the page, because we don't neatly move through the change curve. We don't sort of one day um, in shock, the next day in denial, spend a week in frustration, two days in, in sort of depression experimentation. It's, it's not a neat process, um, which is why when you're looking to build a sustainable job search, it's understanding that this can be messy. And even if you're currently in a role and you're frustrated and you're looking for the next move and you're really not enjoying things, um, this, this change curve and this kind of messiness can still um, be relevant. But in all of that change, all of that uncertainty and all of that craziness and messiness, there is always a choice on how we respond to our situation. That's the one thing when you feel completely out of control, completely overwhelmed, you always have a choice on how you can respond. And again, in a redundancy setting, we all know it's jobs, it's, it's jobs and not individuals that are made redundant. And yet it was 10 years since my last redundancy. And I still say when I was made redundant because of all those things I mentioned at the start, our jobs are part of us. We put a huge amount of energy, a huge amount of time and commitment into them. So they do feel like they're part of our identity. They do feel personal. But a redundancy happens to people. It doesn't happen because of you. And certainly being able to create some of that distance between yourself and your redundancy can help in your position yourself in the marketplace, because before that announcement was made, you're still that person that has all those skills, those gifts, those talents that you can offer another organisation. A redundancy hasn't changed any of that. That's all still there. And certainly when I'm coaching people um, to help prepare for interviews, that's a really important shift in the language, that subtle shift that it was my role that was made redundant. It wasn't me. So being in control of what happens next and also feeling that sense of control for those of you that are in a role and looking to decide what the next move looks like, um, what do you need from a job, what do you want from a job, and again, being specific about what you're looking for. So resilience is a whole workshop in itself, but I just wanted to touch on it very briefly because no matter your situation, in a changing marketplace. And it was really great to hear some of the positive stuff that Nick was talking about and overlaying that against your own personal experience at the moment. Resilience is that thing that you're gonna to need to underpin all of this, no matter the situation that you're in. And certainly until I was faced with, with certain challenges in my life, I thought that other people were resilient, it wasn't me. I did think that you were born resilient, you know, that, that was just what you were. Um, but as Cheryl Sandberg quite neatly explains, it's, it's not that you're born with it, you don't have it or you don't, it's something that you can build up over time. And as I say, um, you can go into it in a lot more detail, but I just want to pick up on a couple of points for those of you that may want to look at resilience in more detail. I came across this TED talk quite recently by Lucy Hone, who's a researcher and author, and there's a link at the bottom and the slides are going out as well, so you can follow the link if you want to. Um, and through her own sort of harrowing personal experience and her research, 
um, she came up with these three secrets of resilient people, which really resonated with me through my own experience and also thinking about supporting clients. My little thingy doesn't want to work. There we go. So the first, the first point, and this might resonate with you as well, is it's not, well, what, you know, why did this happen to me? Well, actually, everyone endures suffering at some stage in their lives. So why, why not happen to you? Um, I found myself in my first redundancy. I didn't know anyone else that had been made redundant. It was about 15 years ago. It was when jobs, I worked in a company where it was jobs for life. I didn't have anyone in my peer group. And I did spend a lot of time thinking, well, why has this happened to me? You know, why has this happened to me? It wasn't particularly helpful. And that perspective didn't serve me well. Her second secret, as she puts it, is making sure that you focus your attention not on what you've lost, but what you still have. And I'll come on to that in a moment um, as we talk about uh, gratitude. So again, even if you're thinking about moving on, you're thinking about um, the fact that you're frustrated or you can't find that next role, but let's think about what you've still got. Let's think about what's still good in the world that can keep you motivated, keep you positive, keep you optimistic. And also this point at the end about are the actions, my thoughts, my feelings, the things that I'm doing, are they helping me or are they getting in my way? So am I spending hours scrolling through social media, looking at everyone else's seemingly perfect lives um, when I'm sitting at home wondering where um, I'm going to find my next role? Is that helping me or is that harming me? Or am I just procrastinating over the fact that I need to update my CV, but I've decided to watch Netflix today with a tub of ice cream? Is that helping me or is it harming me? Now, nothing wrong with ice cream and Netflix, but you know, think about... That you have control over these things. So you have control over how you can um, take positive steps and think about building resilience. So the TED Talks there, um, there's a link there if you want to check it out. I found it really, really useful. So just two things then thinking about resilience, and I say we could go into this in a lot more detail, is the practice of gratitude. Um, some of you may already practice gratitude. Some of you may have heard of it and thought no, that sounds a bit difficult. Um, but there are lots of benefits to practicing gratitude and remembering those things that you are, that are grateful for, that are positive in your life, no matter what situation you're in with regard to your job search. So those are the benefits. And one really simple way, if you want to practice gratitude, and I certainly do it, and it does make a positive difference, is just to have a pen and paper by your bedside, nothing fancy. And each night before you go to bed, write down three things you're grateful for. They can be whatever you want. It could be that you've had a chat with a friend, that you had some nice food, that it was sunny today. It doesn't matter. And over time, you'll notice themes that you're writing down in your gratitude journal. And you'll be surprised at what you actually are grateful for and what you still have in your life. And those things which will drive you forward and, and motivate you and create those feelings of optimism. And when you do it at night as well, it helps your brain to kind of percolate overnight. You, know, you go to bed thinking about positive thoughts, positive feelings. Um, and, and it can help in terms of positivity um, when you get up in the morning. There are other ways to practice gratitude. Again, there's a link on there if you want to check it out and think about it. But certainly um, as, a, as a sort of a pillar of um, maintaining and practicing resilience, I think it's one that is certainly really easy to do and does have a positive impact. So the other piece about um, resilience is this notion of behaviour change. Now, again, this would be a whole workshop. I came across this book quite recently and I was really captivated by how the notion of developing tiny habits and behaviour change could apply to people who are looking for work. Now, I'm not licensed to use the model, so I don't want to get into trouble here by sticking it on the screen. So I've had to just just explain it there. But essentially, um, I've read other books on habit and this one really resonated with me because it's really practical and has structures and tips and exercises and recipes, as, as the author calls them at the end of each uh, chapter. And um, his no notion of behaviour change is essentially that you have to really scale it back and talk about those micro habits, those really small things that might seem so small that you even wonder why you're doing them. So you have to have the motivation, the ability and some kind of a prompt in order to affect behaviour change. You have to have a, an anchor, so attaching it to an existing structure that you have going on in your life, being able to celebrate that you've actually sort of committed to doing that habit and again scaling it all back so it becomes small and achievable. So thinking about that in a job search context, whether you're employed in, in a role or, or whether you are, are looking for a role um, and out of work, thinking about those things which you can do on a daily basis that can really make a difference to changing the course of your job search. So one of my colleagues I was talking to about this said, you know, imagine um, an ocean liner is leaving the port in Sicily, for example, and they've got their coordinates set and they know where they're going. And one of those coordinates changes slightly, they could end up in a completely different, a completely different um, destination. 
So those micro changes that you could make could make an impact um, from a job search perspective. So some ideas might be that you have existing structures, maybe, you know, every morning after breakfast. So that's your cue. That's your prompt. That's your anchor. You say to yourself, I'm going to get my laptop out. I'm going to get my pen, my paper and books, whatever I might need. And that's what I'm going to do after breakfast. And then when I've you know, maybe dropped the kids off at school or come back from a run or whatever it is you do, I'm going to send three LinkedIn requests. That's going to be my micro habits, just something small, but that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to celebrate for the fact that I've done that and say, yeah, yeah, well done. I've done that. And that's my commitment to, to doing something small. Then you might say after your morning coffee, OK, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to set a timer and I'm going to engage on LinkedIn for 20 minutes. That's what I'm going to do. These things are, are really small these things don't have to be, oh, my God, I've got to sit at my computer for three hours today looking on LinkedIn or I've got to contact 10 recruitment agencies and send off 20 applications. You know, those kind of things can feel overwhelming and, and probably not hugely productive either. So, again, something to think about. Think about what those small things could be that you could do that can make a difference to your job search. And again, make you feel that every day, no matter how small, you're doing something to move yourself forward. Um, and again, that can apply whether you're, whether you're in a role or whether you're um, out of a role. Your job to find a job, um, that doesn't mean to say that anyone would expect you to sit there for eight hours um, staring at the computer screen, waiting for emails and job offers to flood in. Um, but essentially, when you're looking for a role, if you can't articulate what's unique about you, then it's going to be very hard for someone else to know what that is. And if you're not out there letting people know that you're available, making those connections with your network, then again, um, it's going to be difficult for people to come out and hunt and come out and hunt and find you. Um, 70 percent, I think, is the statistic of jobs that aren't advertised, which is a huge amount um, to be missing out on if you're not out there um, practicing and sort of engaging with your network. Um, so thinking about who's in your network, who do you know, who do you know that who can introduce you to other people that you don't know yet. I'm really thinking about, well, there's 70 percent of those jobs. I need to be tapping into those. I need to be out there um, and making sure that I'm not missing out. So when you're thinking about the next move um, and whether you've already thought about it and you're making those applications, taking some time back and doing that self inventory. So reminding yourself that you're a person who has certain experiences, you've got these skills, there are things that you know lots about in terms of your knowledge. Um, and again, you're unique in, in these in certain ways. There will be lots of you in the audience today um, who will have similar experience. You know, you may have worked in similar roles, you may have done similar things, but it's the way that you bring all of that together that makes you unique. So when you're in a um, recruitment situation thinking, well, they're interviewing 10 people today, we've probably, we've probably all got similar HR generalist background. Um, you know, why would they want to pick me? Well, all of you will be unique because you can't possibly, even with similar backgrounds, present all of that in the same way. And one thing that I like to candidates to remember is you're a person not a job so describing yourself as you know a people partner um, as an OD specialist well you're actually a person you're, you're not just that job so remembering that when you're you're putting yourself across and talking about all that you have to offer so I'm not going to go through this in, in detail in the interest of time and I'll leave it with you um, to explore later a personal swap can be a great place to start thinking about those things that you're good at, that you enjoy, the things that you're working on in terms of development areas, um, some of the things, the obstacles, the kind of practicalities of life, if you've got other stuff going on that might get in the way of that job search, for example. Um, and thinking about those opportunities, things you want to do more of, things you want to do less of. So for those of you that have a career plan, you know, is that career plan still relevant? Is that something I still want to work towards? Um, you know, what is it I actually want to do? Where do I want to be? And, and one tip that I give you is not to get hung up on job titles. I sometimes work with clients and they say, well, you know, I want to be head of people and culture to put it in a HR context. Well, that job title can mean very different things in different sized organizations. Thinking about what it is, what will the job bring you? What's the scope of the job? What's the responsibility? What's the enrichment that you'll get from working in that role? Rather than it has to be this job title that or otherwise I haven't kind of succeeded. Um, so thinking about some of the opportunities and where, where that might take you. 
And again, that point about re-evaluation, taking stock, taking time out, taking time to reflect. And there's a couple of links there to some free personality tests and, and online strengths tests as well, if you want to check those out. So values, again, some of you may have done these exercises with your teams um, in, in your current roles. Values are incredibly important in a recruitment context and also when you're looking for roles because they help to inform your career decisions. So as you'll know, the values are your sort of unique attitudes and beliefs. Um, they're the things that sort of motivate you, uh, the reason why you do things. And if you've ever done a kind of a career highs and lows exercise, um, which is simply take a piece of paper, draw a line across it, and in chronological order, map some of your career highs and lows above that line, what you'll notice is when you have particular career highs, it's likely to be in times when you were working um, in roles or in organisations where your values were aligned. And when you're having those career lows, the converse can uh, sometimes be true. So our values are important to us and they also help to align with company values. So when you're thinking about that role, that role that, you, that you're interested in, well, what kind of a company do you want to work for and how does that align with your values? And also recently, um, those companies who are values led will bring values into the interview process. So they might say, our company values are integrity, teamwork and collaboration, you know. How do those fit with your values or which of those resonate with you and why? So knowing your values has, has a number of different benefits. So if you haven't done that exercise, there's um, Mind Tools has, a, has quite a nice one that you can investigate and go through and really be clear on your values and how that they will come up in your job search. Uh, personal brand, I know Nick's going to talk a little bit about personal brand, but again, I was talking about what makes you unique. So think about these things. What is your personal brand and how does that run through the rest of what you do in a job search? How does it run through and show up in your CV? How does it show up when you're an interview? So these are things that are their behaviours, they're your values, that's the reputation. Jeff Bezos says you'll know your personal brand is the thing that people say about you when you're not in the room. So what do you stand for? You know, and it's, it's the authentic you, it's the, nat it's the natural you. Uh, what do other people say about you? So do give some thought to personal brand and this notion about putting your unique self across. Um, particularly in, in what can be a crowded marketplace. And then thinking about the good day and the bad day. You know, we've all had those days at work when we've come home smiling like this dog. Um, and we've all had those days when we would rather just curl up and feel a bit miserable like the dog on the right. So, um, you know, what makes a good day a good day? It, was it who you're working with? Was it where you were working? Was it what you were working on? Was it your level of autonomy? Was it the fact you were out of your comfort zone or inside your comfort zone? So thinking about what makes a good day, what makes a bad day, and informing that as part of your job search. So I spent some time working in reward um, in my uh, career a number of years ago, and I enjoyed that time, but I did not like sitting in front of a spreadsheet for hours on end. That was a bad day for me. Someone presented me the data all nicely analysed. I'd quite enjoy that. But having to analyse it myself, it, didn't, it wasn't playing to my strengths. So I knew that I didn't want to do more of that because for me, I felt like the dog on the right when I come home from the day staring at spreadsheets. So you're going to have those things. And this is an opportunity to influence what you do want to do and to look for in a role those things which will be ticking the boxes on the good day. So take some time to have a, have a think about those. And Nick's going to talk about you know, how to position yourself with your CV and how often do we see CVs that are a list of responsibilities responsible for X, Y and Z. When you're thinking about how to position yourself in the marketplace, it's about putting your achievements across. Because no matter whether you're out of work or whether you're in work, employers are looking for you to solve their problem. And so they have a problem to fix and they want to know if you can solve it. And by listing out your achievements and showing the impact you've made and the difference you've made, you can demonstrate if you solved that problem before and therefore it helps them to make that link and to understand if you'd be able to work for them and solve their problems. So taking that step back, thinking about what difference did you make? What impact did you have? Um, you know, what problems have you solved? So sort of what fresh ideas did you bring? How did you um, affect change? And the question that I really love um, asking uh, clients, particularly when they say, well, oh, I just went and did my job. You know, I just did whatever came up. I, you know, whatever they asked me to do, I just do it. And we love people like that, don't we? We love working with people that just get on with stuff. Um, 
but this last question I think can be really powerful is what's the legacy that you're leaving behind in that organization so had it not been for you what wouldn't have happened and almost like taking that step back and, and visualizing yourself outside looking in looking back in on the team looking back in on the organization and thinking do you know what if it wasn't for me that wouldn't have happened that's the legacy I'm leaving behind that's the difference I made that's the impact I made and that's what I'm really proud of that I made a difference so take some time out to think about those questions it can help to position you when you're reflecting them in your CV there's lots of juicy interview material in there as well um, getting some great examples that you can use and it's also about saying well do you know what if that's what I've achieved I want to do more of that so that's what I want to look for in my next role and also a great opportunity to ask for feedback. And this is great because you can ask lots of these open questions and it's also part of that networking. So letting people know that you're looking for work, letting people know that you're out of work, whatever your situation is, reaching out to your network and gathering that feedback is really, really fantastic. Because again, it gives you lots of material. It gives you the, the feedback. And again, with all feedback, you can choose what you do with it. Um, but it also helps with networking also helps in building relationships. Oh, I didn't know that June was, that June was looking for a new role um, within learning and development. We, you know, we've got an opening, why don't I introduce you? You know, you just don't know what's out there in, until you are. So asking for feedback is a great way. If you're not keen on doing the whole networking thing, this is one way that you can do that. And certainly asking for recommendations on LinkedIn. I know Nick's gonna talk about LinkedIn, but that's another great way to start some networking um, and to get that feedback as well. And then what I'd say is to kind of dream big, you know, have, have that dream. What is the thing that you really want to do? You know, if you knew you couldn't fail, you know, if you knew that you had all the support around you, what is possible? And taking that, that step back, thinking about what is it that I dream about doing? Do I want to set up a surf school in Cornwall? You know, do I want to have my own business? Do I um, want to lead a team? Do I want to take on some sort of more supervisory responsibility because I'd really like to help grow and develop people? It doesn't matter what your dream is. But when you think about what that dream is, you have a vision. You have something you want to, to work for. You have something that's worth kind of um, putting all the effort in for and then thinking about okay so how does my current search how does what I'm looking for now fit in with that dream it might not be the dream job is the next one that you go for but knowing that the, this this next move is part of that overall master plan so thinking about it in, the, in that context can be helpful I'm not going to go through all of these again it's something to leave you with some questions to think about bringing all of this together Asking yourself some of these questions can really help to narrow down what it, it what is it that you're looking for, which makes your job search easier because you're not just going on to, um, you know, Indeed, for example, and typing in HR consultant and then you've been bombarded, bombarded by thousands of them, many of which are too far away, the wrong salary and um, don't have the right scope of responsibility, etc. So really thinking about some of these again, it's part of that inventory piece. And then finally, just thinking about how you approach your search. Um, this was a, a LinkedIn post that I did recently. So um, if you do want to connect with me on LinkedIn, very happy for you to do that. Um, and this was quite a popular post talking about you know, approaching a job search. So for those of you who are um, not at work at the moment, you have this wonderful opportunity to manage your diary. No one is control of your diary. So when someone rings up and says, I'd like to, you know, invite you to an interview at eight o'clock in the morning. You think to yourself, it's no, it's no good asking me to do anything at eight o'clock in the morning. I'll be useless. You can say, actually, you know, three o'clock would suit me better. So think about managing your time. Think about managing your diary because you're in control of that um, and when you're at your best. Trying wherever possible to show up every day. And again, going back to some of those micro habits that I talked about, say, even if you're in a job every day, doing something that can help to move you um, that next step forward so showing up every day and even if showing up every day means making a plan for tomorrow because you just you just don't feel like it we, we all have days like that but do try and make those daily commitments being that team player um particularly in a redundancy situation uh you know reaching out to some of the other colleagues that might be in a similar situation there'll be people on this call today that you that you know um that you want to kind of buddy up with having that accountability partner can be really helpful so thinking about that sort of that team context and also balancing your time 
you don't have to spend eight hours, you know, looking at a screen, as you said before, um, or all the, the all the evenings that you come home from work, if, you know, when you're currently at work, um, looking for jobs and you know, finding that that's quite overwhelming and you're on screens till 12 o'clock at night. So thinking about how you balance your time um, is all part of making the job search sustainable and introducing structures and routines, particularly for those of you that are in a redundancy situation. Obviously, set yourself some goals and then break those down. Now, being organised, I've worked with clients, and again, this applies to whether you're whether you're in work or not, um, and you know, busily applying for jobs, and that's great. And then you get that phone call, and it says, "Oh, hi, it's uh, June Hogan from Marble Coaching. Is it good to have a chat with you about the um, HR manager's job you applied for?" And you think to yourself, "Oh my God, who's June Hogan? Who's Marble Coaching? Did I apply for that job?" And you think, "Well, I'll just say yes, and in a few minutes, I'm sure it'll all piece together." Um, so if you've got something that's a really super simple spreadsheet, you know, when did you apply for the job? Who was it with? You know, you can, I'm not going to teach you guys to suck eggs, but having something simple, easily accessible, even just stick it on the wall so that you can track your applications. You've got people on there who are then part of your network. So if you've connected with a recruitment consultant, they become part of your network. Um, also, one recommendation is to take screenshots of, of jobs that you apply for because not everybody will send you a nice glossy person and job spec that goes with um, the job before an interview. So take those screenshots and also save them with a copy of your CV that you've sent off. So you're not scrabbling around wondering which version, version that you sent them. That can help to bring back some control. And it's also a great way to track um, your progress. Know what you're looking for. Put the effort in, as I said before, it, this, this is a process that, that does require a lot of effort. There are lots of credible candidates out there at the moment. Um, so you need to be prepared um, to put the effort in and also make time to talk. Have that small talk. Use your network. Talk to people. Um, and again, if you want to consider some kind of an accountability partner or a buddy, I'd highly recommend that. Certainly um, have a few clients that find that that's really useful. And then finally, it's all about balance. And this probably applies more to those of you who are currently um, out of work. <coughs> Excuse me. So establishing a routine, a routine that works for you, bringing some structure to that day that, you know, just stretches ahead of you. And you think I've actually got nothing in my diary today and nothing to do. Go back to those micro habits. Think about those structures. Think about what you want to do in this period of time and make things for things that you like to do. You don't have to spend 12 hours a day looking for a job. You can maybe you know, do some more exercise or think about doing baking or go out on your road bike or whatever it is you want to do. Make time for things that you'd like to do and give yourself some of those rewards. We all know the impact of daily exercise has on physical and mental health. It doesn't have to be a 10K run and sunrise yoga before your, you know, your kale smoothie at seven. You know, it just has to be something that gets you out and about a chance to get out in the fresh air. Eating and sleeping well is, is important. And again, lots of these are sort of workshops in themselves. So there's a, a link at the bottom to do some more research if you want to. And use your time wisely. This is a really interesting one because um, depending on the time it takes you to find that new role, and I'm, I'm thinking more for those people who are looking for work and currently out of work, um, the recruiter is likely to say, you know, so, so I see that you finished with your last job in November. What have you been up to? Now, Saying I've you know, spent a lot of time watching Netflix might well be the truth, um, but it's probably not the best thing to talk about at the start of an interview. So thinking about what you've actually done. Have you done some more reading? Have you taken an online course? Have you decided to get fit? Have you done some volunteering? Again, it doesn't matter. These things are we're not prescriptive about this stuff, but have something to talk about. And the more relevant, the better. Um, so I think... That takes me to, yes, and there's one more link on the bottom there, uh, Dr. Chatterjee, The Four Pillars of Health. He's got some fantastic podcasts um, from a whole range of people. So whether, you know, no matter what situation you're in, I'm sure there's some interesting stuff that you'll be able to find on there on the topics of health, well-being, uh, resilience. There's loads of great stuff there. So do check that out. Um, and I think that's me. And I think I might even be on time as well. So um, <laughs> You certainly are, Jean. Well done. Well well done. The, the Lego clock worked well. <laughs> yes, that sounds Lego clock. <laughs> well, that, that was really interesting, June, and, and certainly you, you, you've called back to my dream of opening that surf school up in Cornwall. Um, that certainly, as the sun comes out, is what I'm I'm thinking about. But also that values exercise. I think I'm going to try that after after today. Um, so, uh, just a few questions for you. Um, I'm going to start with a question uh, about. Uh, what other resources can you recommend uh, to support your search? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, 
I really like Guardian Jobs they, and, and the Guardian in general. They've got some fantastic resources in there. There's loads of free stuff out there, which, which I love to recommend to people because not everyone's going to have the benefit of a career coach. Not everyone's going to have the benefit of our, our placement support either. So uh, hopefully what I've done today is given you some access to those ones. So I'd really recommend the Guardian, There's some great articles in there. Um, certainly keeping up to date with you know, BBC News, BBC Business. Um, one of the things as well that I sometimes find, particularly I've been supporting um, some people, uh, women who are coming back into the workplace after a period of time out looking after children, and they say, I don't, I'm not really up to speed with the language of work. I've forgotten, like, you know, how to speak in kind of business speak. Um, so there's places like Accenture and Gartner do some, again, great articles that can help to kind of bring you up to speed with, you know, the sort of the language of work um, can also help with your sort of business awareness, business acumen, thinking about, you know, what's current um, and that kind of thing. So they're, they're great as well. Harvard Business Review is good, but of course you have to subscribe. There are some free, there is some free stuff on, on, on HBR, but it is subscription. Um, people management, again, online. And also sort of deepening your own uh, sort of interest in a particular area. You know, you might decide that, I mean, books, obviously, they're, uh, they're sort of between sort of seven and ten pounds. But, you know, if you're really interested in moving into a specific area of HR, then, then thinking about that as well. Um, I'm not on any book deals, sadly. I don't get any compensation for referring any of the stuff I've mentioned today. It'd be great if I did, wouldn't it? But um, certainly there's other books like Squiggly Careers. They do a great podcast. Um, I haven't listened to it, but I have read the book. Um, so that's one to recommend as well. And maybe other people have got ideas in the chat. So um, there's lots out there that's free. So I say, don't think that you, you, know, you have to go and buy loads of stuff, but downloading the odd book or the odd podcast can also be helpful. Yeah, well, well I'll throw in a plug for the CIPD. Um, you know, the YouTube channel is really good. Um, and a lot of the sessions that have been done over the last year because of the pandemic have been recorded. So um, if books aren't your thing or if, you know, you're doing something else and you want to you want to catch up, um, YouTube's very good. The CIPD channel there, um, there's there's a lot of good speak speakers on there, as, as you will be, June. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next question I have is, is how can we deal with setbacks such as not getting an interview or, or getting to final stages and, and not getting the job? Yeah, and, and, and that can be tough. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no getting away from it. And certainly um, when, when I'm working with clients in, in those situations, it is about remembering um, that in spite of that, that feedback or sometimes that lack of feedback, you know, we've all heard about people just getting ghosted, even people that get to the second stage. I've heard of um, somebody recently, senior director, second stage interview, large corporate company, absolutely no feedback. I mean, it's just, just shocking. Um, so thinking about what does what are these sort of stories that we make up for ourselves? Oh, you know, I, I didn't get I didn't get any feedback. It must be because I wasn't good enough. Or, you know, oh well, they've given me that feedback um, that they they've chosen the more experienced candidate. Well, that has nothing to do with you. That just has it's the fact that maybe you didn't have the you know the same level of experience. So thinking about what are the stories that are going through my mind? How helpful are these stories that I'm kind of ruminating over and, and playing back in my mind? I could have done better at that. I should be better at this. I should have got an interview by now. I should have got a new job, all of those shoulds. And thinking to yourself, well, actually, how much of that do I know is true? So if I'm saying I didn't get the interview because I wasn't good enough, well, what evidence do I have of that? So really thinking about, again, taking back some of that control. Is what I'm doing helping or harming me? Are those thoughts useful? Is this actually helpful and going to help them to move me forward? Um, and knowing that setbacks are going to come that's, that's part of a job search. It's, 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 it's realistic. Um, and one of the, the um, quotes I heard recently, you know, looking for a job is, is, is a survival skill now. You know, it's something that everyone needs to know how to do. So, um, you know, again, approaching it with realism, and then thinking about, well, actually, how helpful are some of these thoughts and how helpful is the way that I'm reacting to that feedback? And like feed, any feedback, we have a choice about what we do with it. We can ignore Absolutely. it. We can decide to do something about it or not. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely true. I remember when uh, when my dad gave me a careers book and, and I think the lesson in there was until you fill your, all your walls with rejection letters, then you shouldn't give up on the job search, <laughs> which I thought was quite a, quite a, a long time to perhaps be waiting and, and quite a waste of wool. But um, anyway, <laughs> if someone is in panic mode, how do you keep yourself grounded through the process? 
Yeah, so in panic mode, um, I would say being able to notice what is panic mode in, in the first instance. So how does that show up for you? Um, and, you know, panic mode, you might notice that, you know, you're more anxious or that you're just applying for any job that comes up or you're just kind of feeling that, that, that overwhelm and that kind of that desperation and noticing that. Um, and a really practical way before you sort of move into any kind of action would be to do some 7-11 breathing, for example. So seven breaths in through the nose, 11 out through the mouth um, and, and doing that to kind of ground yourself and really transcend to yourself and say, OK, again, what am I in control of here? What is it that I'm looking for? What is it I'm trying to achieve? And really just bringing some some balance and some focus back to what can be a stressful, a stressful situation. And I think, um, you know, panic mode can be different things for, for different people. And certainly when we're in that sort of stress mode, as opposed to that competency mode and the impact that it has on us kind of physically and mentally, we're not going to be at our best. We're not going to be able to do our best work. Um, so I think the first the first is noticing it. And then doing some of that, those simple breathing, simple techniques, and then bringing yourself back to the present moment and taking stock um, and sort of putting it into context and, and bringing some perspective to things. And again, you know, if you don't have the support of a professional, then that redundancy buddy, that accountability partner, the person that's in your network, the person that you can just pick up the phone to, it's a friend. It doesn't matter who it is, but knowing you've got someone that you can just talk to about these things can make a huge amount of difference. Um, so I think probably a couple of those things might be useful. Yeah. So you talk about um, accountability partners. Um, who who's a good accountability partner? Yeah. I mean, um, I th- it's, it's for you to choose, but typically someone who's in a similar situation to yourself. So someone who is also looking for work. Because one of the great things about that is, and I, I sort of make the analogy of. Um, if you're someone who's reluctant to exercise like I am, you know, if I know that I'm going to do a run or if I'm, you know, in the days when we could go to the gym, going to gym with a friend, I will absolutely make sure that I'm there ready to go. And I'm, you know, I'm on time because I've made that commitment to my friend. So an accountability partner, if someone's in a similar position, you could find yourselves saying, right, okay, you know, 10 o'clock every Monday, we're going to have a check-in call. We're going to catch up on what we've been doing, share ideas, share tips, um, and really sort of ask each other those challenging questions um, asking, you know, how we got on with setting the goals from last week. So that someone like that can be a, a great accountability partner or somebody from just from your network or someone who's a trusted friend, but someone who's going to kind of hold you to account and, and ask those challenging questions and keep you moving forward. Absolutely. That, that's some really great advice, Jean. I, I, I wish I'd had you around in the various different points I'd been made redundant. That's, uh, that's really useful. Um, thank you very much for your time, Jean. Um, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, um, to Nicola. Nicola, are you, uh, are you ready? I am ready. I will just share my screen again. No, that's, that was really interesting, June, and, and, and actually complements and overlaps into some of what I'm, I'm going to be talking through anyway. So, no, no you've uh, warmed me up there nicely. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I suppose mine, um, my slides now are going to be focusing a bit more on some of that, those real practical um, advice and skills and experiences on, on how to really position yourself uh, in, in such a competitive market that, that we're in at the moment. Um, so, you know, we know that the market is tricky. Um, the competition for roles are at an all-time high, uh, but there are certain things you can do as a, stand- as a candidate to stand out. Um, so I'll be looking at how to develop a strong personal brand, how to ensure your CV ends up on that final shortlist, uh, and how to optimise the interview process, really, so that you can uh, win the race and, and get over that f- final hurdle. So how strong is your employer your, sorry, your personal brand. Um, I suppose the question should be, what is a personal brand? Uh, personal brand really is similar to, to that of a corporate band brand or an employer brand. Uh, it's who you are, it's what you stand for, it's the values you embrace and how you express those values uh, and turn up, as June pointed out. Um, so just as a company's brand helps to communicate its values to customers and stand out from, from their competition, a personal brand does the same for candidates, um, helping you to communicate your own unique identity and your own clear values to to a potential employer. Oops, sorry, I've just jumped ahead a little bit too far there. So think about your brand as a description of your distinct talents and, and, and what it is you represent 
and as, as um, June said, how you want to be talked about when you're not around. So how do we define our brand? Um, well, we can do this through some real clear self analysis um, by considering how you would want others to view you. What you can do is compile a list of traits, ask yourself a number of questions, um, you know, which areas do I feel I excel? What motivates me? What characteristics have others complimented me on? Um, what projects can I spend hours on without feeling overwhelmed or tired? And then maybe on the flip side, some of those that, that don't you don't feel are uh, your particularly stronger traits, you know, think about projects that you may have needed help with um, or which roles you've, you've undertaken that may have drained your energy and you know you want to kind of recognize that those traits do not sit comfortably within your brand okay so um so if you're struggling to answer these questions what i would say is perhaps ask friends ask family ask some of your ex-colleagues or current colleagues how would they describe you it's a lot easier for other people to critique you than to critique yourself uh, and once you're more aware of you know some of the facets of your personality you can then decide how best to, to brand them and bring them to life. Um, you know, one of the things I would say is try and write out a personal brand statement, make it short and snappy, uh, perhaps in the same way you might develop an elevator pitch, something that you can whip out from down up your sleeve and, 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 and you know, a, a clear statement that you really feel truly describes you, your, your personality and, and how you want to be seen. So before you can start talking about your personal brand, you really need to determine who you're going to try, who you're trying to reach, um, who you want to be talking to. Is it other industry thought leaders, um, individuals at a particular organisation that you're interested in working with, recruitment consultants? The sooner you define that audience, the easier it will be to craft your story. Uh, and because you'll have a better understanding of the type of story you need to tell, you'll also need to you know you need to know where to position that story and who you need to tell. So obviously, in, in this instance, we're talking about you know, job search. So you're looking to reach hiring managers and recruiters. The best place to map this audience out is, of course, on LinkedIn. Um, you might want to look at you know, specific sectors, specific geographical locations, uh, if those elements are, of course, important to you. So I, if I was you, I would dedicate some real time to search out relevant contacts, really grow your LinkedIn connection profiles with, with key profiles that will be valuable to you and your job search. Um, and then, you know, follow up, connect, grow your audience, follow up with a nice introductory message just to thank them for, for being um, you know, connected with, with you. And then the next bit is shout about it you need to market yourself once you've got your brand once you've got your audience identified you know you need to be marketing yourself personal brand is not um, much help if you're not telling people what it is so use your statement throughout your entire job search process include it in job applications on your cv on your linkedin profile bring out those brand values um, at interview uh, and just make sure they're consistent in every step of that particular process. Um, also, you know, even outside of a, a job uh, search process, having a predefined brand message in a, you know, elevator style pitch also means that you'd be able to market yourself quickly whenever a chance of networking arises, you know, even on online events, um, when you get the chance to, to have your camera on and actually introduce yourself. So on a smaller scale online event, uh, event where you may have the opportunity to do a bit of a round table and introduce yourself, you've got that brand statement ready and waiting. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about LinkedIn now, um, as is, you know, that is the most obvious platform that we'll be using as, um, as recruiters and as candidates. I think this image might be a little bit blurry, so apolog apologies for that. This is my, my, my own um, LinkedIn profile, so by all means, feel free to send me a connection request if you want to. Um, but the reason that is up there is I just want to show you um, that uh, how to optimise an all-star uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, where that little blue arrow is, that will show you your personal profile strength. Uh, there are five levels of a LinkedIn profile strength, beginner, intermediate, advanced, expert, and all-star. Um, and having an all-star um, LinkedIn profile just really means it's optimized for, for you know, full success and, and you know, visibility. And according to LinkedIn, Profiles with an all-star rating are around 20 times more likely to be found in recruiter searches. 
So I'm going to go on to the next few slides, which um, really help will help you identify that or achieve that all star profile. Um, I do have a more detailed version of this this slide in a, in a document that we generally share with our candidates. Um, and I, I think if we're going to be sharing slides afterwards, I'm more than happy to, to include the, the, these, um, this uh, document as well. Um, so how do we reach our all-star profile? Um, firstly, sounds a bit obvious, but include a photograph. Um, and make sure it's professional. I'm, I'm surprised at how many faceless profiles I see. Uh, if you do add your photo to a LinkedIn profile, it's likely to result in around 15% more views compared to a profile without a photo. Um, I think it just really lacks personality and and and. Um, yeah, I think I think that's pretty much all it is. Um, keep it professional, nice smiley, head and shoulders shot, and just leave off that cute dog or that glass of wine for now. Save that for Facebook. Um, edit your headline. So the headline is the bit that goes underneath uh, your name. Um, uh, typically, you might see somebody's job title in in that section. Now you've got the ability to edit that. Um, you could add a you know, a very short brand statement. What you know? What what do you do rather than what your job title is? So, for instance, as a HR recruiter, I might say helping my clients find their key HR talent. Um, so it's more of a description rather than a job title, and it just um, I suppose it just again it just brings your brand to life a little bit more. Also, if you're looking for a, if you're looking for a new role at the moment, if you're out of work, um, use that use that bit to to identify that you are currently seeking employment you might want to put you know currently available for work in or as a HR advisor or something along those lines and um, that's actually additionally useful because as a recruiter and when we've got a recruiter license we have the ability to search certain keywords and search certain criteria for candidates who are on the market and quite often, if I have an urgent need for a role, perhaps a temp role or an interim role, I will use keywords such as currently looking or available for work. Um, and if, that, if you've put that in your headline or somewhere in your summary, you are more likely to end up on that um, those, those searches. Um, so your bio, number three here is, is your bio summary. This is your real opportunity to show what you stand for, showcase your brand, bring it to life. There are all sorts of little things you can do here. You can embed videos, you can embed photos. Um, so you, you could potentially be really creative with, with that section. So potential employers uh, often check out prospective employees' profiles on LinkedIn. Um, and this is where the recommendation section can really solidify that decision to move you forward, perhaps in a, in a process. Uh, so you know, don't be afraid to, to ask contacts for, for recommendations, um, especially if they're good contacts. You know, why would they say no? Uh, there is a real easy functionality as well within LinkedIn that where you, whereby you can just click a button and ask recommendation and it'll automatically send that contact a message. And then they can quite easily reply with their, with their recommendation for you to then accept it and for it to then appear on your profile. So get busy getting those recommendation requests out. Uh, again, going back to that sort of search criteria, number five here, um, LinkedIn acts as a very large database of candidates for recruiters. Um, and, you know, profiles can be found using criteria based on keywords. For instance, if you are a strong employee relations expert, make sure you have employee relations written within your summary or reward or whatever those, uh, whatever those sort of experiences you want to be found for, have those keywords in there because they will they will pop up on searches. And then um, volunteering work, as you mentioned, you know, if you, what have you been, if you have been unfortunately out of work, how have you been filling that time? Use it to your advantage, um, you know, volunteer, extracurriculum um, activities that will really add value to, to you as a, as a candidate. And then uh, Add, add anything like that within into the profile as well in your summary section. Actually, employer, uh, employers have actually stated that volunteer work and extracurriculum work can be as valuable as your, your actual employment at times. And then, you know, keep it up to date. Regular activity, especially if you are active in the market, regularly updating your profile will, can, will keep it active, will keep it popping up in searches, will keep it on people's um, storyboards. Uh, so just keep it current, keep it relevant. 
On the flip side of that, which is why we've added eight here, if you are active, but you don't want to be known by your current employer for being active, now that obviously can be a little bit nerve wracking if you are updating your LinkedIn profile because it can um, alert your current employer to that. So there is a way you can go and switch that activity off under your settings. You can go and turn turn off your activity broadcast. So if you are updating your profile, but you don't want your current employer to, to know just at this time, then that might be something you want to look into. Number nine, again, quite obvious, perhaps you add your education on there. It'll, it's, all, it, it's all added value stuff. You know, CIPD, even if you're, you know, if you're part CIPD qualified and you haven't completed it yet, mention that, mention that you are quali- you're studying CIPD currently, any coaching qualifications, mediation courses that you've undertaken, anything like that, that you think would add value and that you want to be known for. And then number 10, potential employers would prob- probably want to see a full understanding of you as a person. So, do add some personal elements in there, not too personal, um, but things like hobbies, um, you know, makes you more relatable and make it may even spark up a conversation um, about a mutual interest with somebody. LinkedIn, uh, of course, offers a way of social media networking, um, but there are other ways of interacting with your audience um, or, or to, you know, to sort of get yourself out there. Things like um, commenting on posts, sharing articles uh, that other people have have put out there and and having an opinion of your own. Join LinkedIn groups, various LinkedIn groups that you have an interest in and just get involved in discussions on there, have an opinion, just be visible. It's all PR, it's all um, getting your brand out there and sending those little subliminal messages. Um, obviously, unfortunately, when we're not able to physically network together, um, but there are plenty of other ways to develop connections and network with people uh, remotely. You know, you might want to join as many net, uh, net webinars as possible, you know, especially those ones that allow you to interact with other participants. You know, when you've got the camera on, you've got your microphone on, you can share best practice, discuss and offer up opinions. Um, Network with recruitment consultants, keep in regular contact with them, pick up the phone to them, just remain on their radar. As a recruitment consultant, you are, I'm speaking to many candidates on a daily basis. And if I was to remember every single one, every single day when a new live job comes out, you know, I'd be an absolute genius. So those, those candidates that will drop me a quick note, pick up the phone and just say, I'm still here, by the way, they will be more likely to be at the front of my mind when a lot when a role lands so keep networking with your recruitment consultants perhaps suggest zoom one-to-one zoom coffee chats with people um june mentioned buddying up so if there's somebody that uh, you're connected with on on linkedin but you've never met them but you think that they would be a really good mutual contact drop them a note and suggest a coffee a coffee and a zoom chat as as we would if we were meeting up for someone in a coffee shop um, you know peer level connections who are potentially also out of work and you can share your own personal experiences support each other and then the other thing i think is a, a lot of people don't think about doing compile a list of employers that you would love to work for, Uh, connect with their HR teams, connect with their recruitment teams, Um, keep in touch, message them and tell them that you would, you've always loved the thought of working for them. Uh, The time probably won't be right at that point, um, but that's not bad because in a two or three, four or five weeks time, the time might be right and they'll remember you instantly and they could proactively then come back out to you say we're, we're actually now hiring and you're already ahead of the competition at that point. So there are just a few ideas of how you can continue to network whilst we are in a, a lockdown scenario. Okay, so um, brand is sorted, you've been networking like mad, now you need to get your CV on that shortlist for the dream job. So there's so much opinion around what a good CV looks like. And, and to an extent, this is a very subjective subject. Um, how you choose to represent yourself uh, on paper is really up to you. But the one thing I would say, it's about content and how easy it is to digest and not how pretty it looks. So I've seen thousands of CVs 
over the years. Um, and I do have a personal preference on what makes good CV. And as HR professionals, I know you would have also seen a fair few of CVs yourself and maybe have your own view. But I think it doesn't matter how many CVs we've all seen when it comes to our own. Um, it can be really difficult to know what good looks and how to position yourself. Uh, so some of these things on, on, on my slide here may, may well be obvious, but they are my personal preferences and my personal pop, uh, personal top tips. So first, first of all, layout, as I say, keep it simple, no fancy graphics. Um, it's about content, as I say. Um, it's how easy, how easy it is to digest. That hiring manager may be sitting on 30, 40 CVs to go through. They're going to be scouring that CV for and willing that CV to meet the criteria they're looking for. You know, they're going to be looking for what they want to find. So give that information over easily. In terms of layout, very simple, name and contact details, summary underneath with relevant, relevant skills to that particular role that you're applying for. And you, you'll need to do some work each and every time you apply for a new job. And that's not bending the truth, it's pulling out the relevant experience that applies to that particular vacancy. Obviously then, career history in chronological order, education, and if you wish, hobbies. I, I mean, I've put a question mark next to hobbies. I don't personally feel there's a place for hobbies on a CV unless they come with some major achievement, you know, you win competitions, um, you know, you've got medals for something. It, it, I think it's got something pretty impressive, but if it's just that you walk a dog and read a book, um, personally, I would keep that off. Um, and then underneath, something that a lot of people miss, underneath the uh, organisation that you've worked for, just a brief line on size of organisation, sector, uh, take the guesswork out of it, especially if they're, they're a smaller businesses and, and not a recognised brand. The amount of times I have to go and Google uh, a company that I don't recognise just to get a feel for, for the sector and, and, and um, you know, what type of organisation they are. So just make it easier for the, for the, uh, the, the reader to, to identify some of that information that they're looking for. And then, go, uh, and, uh, you know, again, on, on June's point from earlier, responsibility is great but achievements is that real added value stuff um solving that problem you know, what have you done that that, that this the, the reader can identify and say wow we want that person to come and do that here um so make sure you add a good couple of rounded achievements um against each fake um job that you've you've worked and then what I would do, you know, especially, you know, many of you perhaps have been on the hiring side and have had to look at a CV, sit back, look at your CV, look at the job spec. Remember, they don't know you as a person at this stage. They are looking at a piece of paper with writing on it. The, there's no personality. There's no, you know, it's, it's as black and white as that. Would you hire, hire you or even invite you to interview based on that CV compared to that advert or that job spec. And if you wouldn't, then you, you're probably applying for the wrong role or you haven't pulled through the right information on your CV. So I would do that for each and every application that you make. OK, so um, just quickly on, on this, you know, one thing that I would say is once you've got your CV out, don't be afraid to follow up. And I'm not talking a week or two weeks down the line when you haven't heard anything. That might be a little bit too late. If it's a recruitment consultant like myself, pick up the phone, introduce yourself, just get yourself ahead um, of the, 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 the competition. Uh, I had a, a very similar experience recently. I had a, a rollout with about 100 CVs coming in over a very short space of time. And this particular candidate picked up the phone and introduced herself to me. And I loved the way she... Uh, held herself and uh, engaged with me over the phone and she very got quick very quickly got put to the front of the the list and ended up on that short list had she if she hadn't done that I couldn't tell you but she certainly did you know by by stepping up and and um, following up with me right so just on to the last hurdle I suppose you know how to win that race your your hopefully your competition hopefully has now been whittled down to a handful of people uh, who have been invited to interview so again as hr professionals you may well have spent more time on the interviewer's side of the desk 
than the interviewees, but this does not make us experts. Um, very much like preparing a CV for a job application, you should prepare differently for each and every interview. And this is how I personally help my, my candidates prepare for interviews that, that, I'm, that I'm putting um, them forward for. So first of all, check out who you're going to be meeting, check them out on LinkedIn. I mean, if you wanna go an extra level, check them out on Facebook, um, but just don't become too much of a, a stalker. Um, look at any commonalities that you might have. You may have, they may have worked somewhere that you've got a very good friend working for. So they may well be able, you may be able to tap into um, a real common connection there. Read over the job criteria, preempt questions. Yeah, the, the, the questions are hidden there in that job spec. Um, if you were writing questions based on that, that job spec, then, you know, you could pretty much guess what they're going to ask you. So you have some pre, pre, um, prepared answers um, to those preempted questions. Put yourself in the shoes of the interviewers. They are, as June said, solving a problem or they, are, they have a problem to solve. What are their pain points? Are they overworked? Do they have someone off a of maternity and, and uh, leave and that they, 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 you know, the impact of that is, is the extra burden of work on their shoulders? Do, are they lacking a skill set perhaps? Think about what it is that their pain points are so you can go in there and, and really try and plug those gaps um the obvious one for with all the virtual interviewing that we're going through is you know, check technology beforehand um check the room lighting camera positioning practice run with a friend perhaps or a colleague if you are new to video interviewing so have a real run through with with them so that it takes that kind of the edge off any nerves that you might be feeling last hurdle then we, have, we are in a world at the moment where the recruitment process and onboarding are being handled online. Um, so whether on in person or online, I think some of these um, tips are quite key. Um, so going back to your brand values, remember those, bring them out at interview and just make sure they are consistent with the messages that you have been putting out from the very beginning. Uh, going back to, you know, looking at who your interviewers are, build build an early rapport by, by identifying some common interests perhaps that you have um, spotted in your, in your prep and bring that out at the beginning. So that rapport is, is, is really fresh. Uh, look into the camera. Um, now, this is a strange one for everyone. Uh, we're, you know, we're in a face-to-face -face, uh, physical interview. We, we look into the eyes of, of uh, uh, the people we're meeting and it's so easy to keep looking at yourself um, in the, um, <laughs> the, the uh, which is distracting me right now. Um, so try and practice looking into that camera. That's the closest you're going to get to eye contact and building that real rapport. Uh, and, and then, like I said earlier, try on, try early on to establish what problems you are going to resolve for them. Try and establish what that is for them. Uh, it may be well be different to each each and every uh, interviewer that you meet, um, but you are talking to them and you are promising them that you are going to be solving those problems for them. Use the STAR technique. Um, hopefully you'll have heard the STAR competency technique, situation, task, action, and results. Um, even if a competency question isn't asked of you, whereby they say, give me an example of when, if it isn't positioned in that way, still give them an answer that is positioned around the STAR technique because you are still then offering up that real um, evidence, I suppose, of, of how you meet that competency. Um, and at the end, Ask them if they have any concerns. Ask them if you know how you how they felt you got on, or if there are any gaps that they would like you to to fill at that point. Okay, and I felt like I was rushing through that, so sorry about that. We're just looking at time, um, and very finally there. Um, maybe follow up. I would say perhaps not by phone, might be a little bit too pushy, but a gentle LinkedIn message, email, thanking them for the time confirming your interest levels because it is a two-way process um, and actually and, and, and stating that they you know you hope that there's a mutual interest and you look forward to hearing from them soon so just that gentle follow-up the day the day of or the day after is is just a, an extra level of um, I suppose embedding yourself um, with them and that's my final slide any Brilliant. questions
<laughs> well, thanks very much, Nick. Uh, well, while you were talking, we've, we've actually volunteered you um, and June to uh, to do a follow up video to this uh, <laughs> because we've we've had loads of questions, particularly about transitioning between roles and transitioning between yeah. sectors. Um, and we'd really like to go into a deeper dive than definitely we've got time for um, today. Yes. So um, hopefully, Nick, you'll be happy enough. That's to, fine. To I was, yeah, I had my eye on the time. I know there's been some great questions coming through. So that would be good. Cool. Um, and, and and I think uh, just a couple of questions on, on LinkedIn while we do still have a few minutes left. Um, what about this? Um, I think it's the, the back to work or looking for work uh, green banner that oh. appears up. Yes, the controversial green banner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's, thought? yeah, I mean, I'd seen some awful posts uh, from people over the over the month saying that they shouldn't, people shouldn't have this green banner and almost like, you know, it's a, it's a badge of shame or something. I don't know. I just think that's, that's ridiculous. You know, it's not, you shouldn't be ashamed of being out of work. So, and if it helps you stand out, uh, especially when, you know, if someone's looking for interim people and you you know you're there ready and willing to, to to jump into a role very quickly then absolutely have that green banner on I would say yeah I mean it's a lovely collective thing isn't it and particularly you know the times I've been out of work you, you do suddenly go from being part of an organization to being out of one and um you know it can feel very lonely so knowing that there are other people out there I think in your shoes is, is quite a nice thing yeah um, <laughs> uh, the the the, uh, the other one that I had was um if you are, if your interviewers do look at you at LinkedIn, and again, I've, I've experienced this, would you reach out and connect to them? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I'd probably even, I don't know. I mean, my personally might even make you say, look, I, or that check, notice you, you, you know, check my profile and I'm looking forward to meeting you. I think it'd be great if we, we could connect. And even if they, I, I would probably connect with them anyway, regardless of whether they looked at me, you know, they're, it's a, it's a that that's what LinkedIn's for is for connecting with with people and drop a drop them a note and say you know I'm looking forward to meeting you. Brilliant. Um, and is it okay to take notes in with you and, and to write your questions down when you're in an interview? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a lot easier to do at the moment with it being virtually, of course. Um, and you know you, you can have your pad on your desk and uh, but but whether it's physical or um, virtually, have have some questions with you. Even write down. A couple of examples. I think it gives um, you a human element. I, if I was an interviewer and a candidate was asked a question and they said, "Oh, I've got a, I've got a really good example for this," but my my mind's just gone a little bit blank. Can I just quickly look at my notes? Part of, I mean, I don't know whether this is uh, you know just my own personal opinion, whether others would feel differently, but I personally would like that. It just we're all human. It's not a memory test. Interviews aren't a memory test. It's about start showing up as the best self and if it means you have to look at refer to some notes just to jog that memory then then why not brilliant okay well i am going to wrap it up here nick because we we have just reached reached 11 yeah. o'clock um but for everyone that's watching we will be sending the slides out afterwards um and also this will be recorded and placed onto the uh, cipd london youtube channel there is a difference there's there's a cipd channel and there's a cipd london one um, which uh, I put a link into the chat box about. Um, and we're also going to get together with June and Nick again and just go through uh, some of the questions that have been raised in the chat uh, in a deeper deeper way. Um, and hopefully we can get something out again in the next month just on, on those things, uh, schedules allowing. So thank you so much for joining today. Um, please, I, I think this is okay uh, for me to say for both June and Nick, please do reach out to all of us on, on LinkedIn. Um, we're always happy to to, to connect with other professionals um, and uh, you know if you do have questions I'm sure they'll be happy to field them on there as well okay thanks so much for joining us today and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon and best of luck with your job searches